Hi everybody, uh, and welcome to the final art week of uh, Humanities 202. It just so happens to also be probably my uh, favorite art week of the semester. Um, I'm probably not telling any tales out of school uh, to think that not all of you have really uh, loved the more abstract works of art. I mean, you may have appreciated them, but some of you may have thought, not all of you, but some of you may have thought, that art seems a little bit aloof, a little bit uh, full of itself, that it's kind of uh, art for art's sake or something like that. Um, it's a little too heady, a little too um, impressed with its own genius. And so, uh, you're not alone if that was something that you thought while you were reading about it or uh, watching the lectures about it. In fact, artists in the 1960s agreed wholeheartedly that, that art had become, um, high art had become far too disconnected from the reality of most people, the experiences of most people. And so if one task of art is to reflect uh, our, the world and our experiences of that world, by the time we get to abstract expressionism, we have become really far afield from that kind of activity, given the cultural context that were happening uh, in the 50s and 60s. So, um, let's talk about pop art. Pop art, long before there was Lady Gaga, um, the, my beloved Lady Gaga, uh, uh, there was pop art, and, and pop art originated actually uh, in England. It's The purpose of it was to turn art away from these kinds of big ideas, these kinds of heady revelations of form and figure and these things, and bring it back to expose the mundane, superficial, and surface level reality that so many people actually experience. That for them, in an age of mass consumerism and mass commodification, in an age of, you know, McDonald's starting to appear, in the age of um, more and more focus on advertisements and marketing, is it outdated or silly? to go to a museum and look at a painting that's just one color, that, that's trying to get you to think about the shape of, of the essence of a certain kind of shape or something like this. In an age of mass commodification, instead of being avant-garde, the pop artists wanted to focus on everyday objects and not uh, to kind of placate to big business, not to encourage mass consumerism. But for them, uh, focusing on these mundane, everyday realities, the kind of junk that we buy and fill our houses with, was a way to get art lovers and people who looked at their art to think about the depth of their own existence. If the artwork is extremely superficial, then what does that make us, the consumers of that particular kind of art? And what does it reflect about us uh, when Andy Warhol is... Uh, simply copying can the covers of cans uh, and lithographs. <clears throat> what does that say about our culture that that's what we produce? Uh, all of this is tied into the idea of postmodernism uh, more generally. In the 1960s in particular, there was something called happenings. Happenings were these spontaneous gatherings of people. They didn't have to be artists. They could be aspiring artists. They could be non-artists. Uh, art didn't just happen in the stuffy, uh, high culture centers. It didn't just happen in museums. It could happen anywhere. It could happen on campus. It could happen, uh, in downtown Johnson City. It could happen anywhere. Um, the point would be people would spontaneously make art together, whether that was playing instruments, painting, poetry. Uh, the only rules about these happenings were that they can't be planned in advance. So it's not like a flash mob kind of situation where you're choreographing Michael Jackson's thriller and then going to the mall to shock your neighbor Deb. 
Instead, uh, these particular happenings were meant to happen truly with strangers, truly um, une unexpectedly, and that they had they have to vanish without a trace. The other rule is that they can't linger on. You can't leave uh, a painting for other people to buy or look at. Instead, everything has to vanish. So it's really not about art, creating art that is a commodity that could be sold and evaluated and treasured. Instead, it's about creating art for the experience, to be in that moment, um, to appreciate the art and then let it go. Uh, if we look at probably one of my favorite artworks from the period, uh, Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing by Richard Hamilton, um, <clears throat> I think what the painting shows us uh, better probably than, than any other painting that I know um, is exactly how much, the extent to which our lives are actually driven by advertisements. The way in which everything that we consume and look at is really just an advertisement for buying something else. Um, and what's at the heart of this in this painting, of course, is this thwarted uh, sexuality that sex sells. It's both an extraordinarily sexualized painting and the most unsexual painting you can imagine. Um, everything in it is phallic or uh, with the lollipop, with um, the woman in the background who is, you know, nearly naked, who's a lamp in the background. The logic of capitalism, according to this painting, is that everything is about something that you're going to buy later. Everything is laying the groundwork for uh, the next purchase, and that's the cultural logic of capitalism. And so art, as a reflection of this, should not try to seek some eternal quality, some quality that will transcend or tap into something that is much older. No, art should rather, to reflect the times, uh, become disposable. Um, in the happenings, that was kind of a positive thing, that treating art in a disposable way was uplifting. Um, we didn't have to feel beholden to putting it in a golden frame and kind of standing in awe of it. Or it can be a negative thing, because essentially this painting, just what is it that makes today's homes so different, so appealing, is really not a painting at all. It's really a collage of things suggesting that we go and buy or desire these other things. Cars, lamps, new technologies for the home, vacuum cleaners, these kinds of things. And when you watch television or you um, watch films, between product placement and actual marketing um, in traditional trailers and commercials, so much of our artwork, uh, entire television episodes, are dedicated to setting up the next episodes that you will continue to watch, or they're set up to make you want to buy an iPad. Um, so I think what this painting does, and what much of pop art does, is show us how our culture is driven by commodities and the desire to buy new things. Um, and that's a really important message. You can also look at Jasper Johns' The Painted Bronze uh, from 1960, which does similar things in that it tries to blur the line between a commodity, in this case beer cans, uh, and a work of art. And so it's very familiar to us when we look at these uh, decorative, this decorative garbage. Uh, that's very familiar to us, and yet it's very unfamiliar because suddenly we are asked to blur the line between high art and our everyday junk. Um, is the division between art and commerce uh, an eternal one? Is, is something that is popular uh, also potentially artistic? Is the logic of capitalism antithetical or complementary to the artistic impulse of what it means to be human that we've been looking at really since the beginning of humanities in general? There's this uncanny quality because the pop artists force us to look at objects that we traditionally ignore um, 
and either recognize how the traditional everyday mundane things are really kind of beautiful, or to ask why don't we surround ourselves with more beautiful things. Um, and those are both questions, I think, that are worth uh, posing. Of course, the most famous pop artist of all, who I'm sure many of you know, is Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol <clears throat> love, had a love-hate relationship with, the po with popular culture. He loved multimedia. He loved marketing. He loved self-promotion. He loved to sell Andy Warhol. And so... Uh, Really, he does these kinds of mass produce. He turns art itself, the creation of art, into another Fordist, mass produced kind of um, enterprise. You can see that with the Campbell soup cans or with the Elvis silk screens. These lithographs that he creates um, tend to be recreations, recycling things. There's nothing new here, it's just repackaging it to make more money. Uh, and of course, Warhol loves uh, selling himself. Um, so there's this love part of we, we should love the soup can, we should love um, shopping carts, we should love all of these things. And there's this hate side of it that is, um, I can't believe it is, it's come to this. I can't believe that humans who have spent millennia uh, creating beautiful things for reflection and self-improvement uh, have come down to uh, making disposable junk to turn a profit. Um, what happens to the aura of art? This is uh, Walter Benjamin, who's a famous theorist of art and other things, um, talked a lot about the, the loss of the aura. The aura is when you go to a museum and you um, see the the original painting and that moment of seeing the actual canvas on which uh, da Vinci or even Rothko and others uh, actually applied the paint there's something kind of reverential about that experience it's a sacred place the fact that they use velvet ropes to mark it off uh, just further cements the fact that we're supposed to treat our art as sacred that it has an aura around it but when you can recreate art in mass, then it loses its aura. And if you've ever been a college student with a famous work of art as a poster in your dorm room, you can attest to the fact that there's something interesting about taking a Van Gogh painting and out of that sacred space and just mass producing it. You can buy it at Target and put it in your room. Now, for Benjamin, that was perhaps a way of democratizing art, that art was no longer just held by the elites. Now everybody had access to art. And that may be, for him, the seeds of social change. More people will have more power. But on the other hand, uh, often people will read his commentary and, and see a kind of melancholy quality that, that the aura was a special thing. Uh, and when we lose the aura, we become... Uh, just copies of copies and replicas and um, commodities. Roy Lichtenstein is another uh, famous pop artist. He uses the kind of pulp comic book images very famous, uh, very famously. It's kind of like our art uh, that we looked at last week, the Abstract Expressionists, because it it focuses on the way in which it was created much more than the subject matter. Uh, it's about a process and not a final product. But on the other hand, um, there's nothing in the Lichtenstein works or really in any of the pop art works that um, romanticizes the painter. We don't care to get into the internal psyche. Like, what what are the dreams of this? independent genius. We don't, we don't care about any of those things in pop art. Instead, we revel in the commercialization of everything. The painter, in this sense, is irrelevant, not because, like an abstract expressionism, we want to move into something more universal, 
um, but because the painter is literally just a cog in the machine here. Um, you can look, the, the Lichtenstein uh, prints and the Warhols and, and all of these works are probably the most famous examples, but actually, as the book shows, there's, there's a lot more going on uh, in pop art than most people realize. Um, you can look at the uh, Oldenburg clothespin sculpture uh, in Philadelphia, which takes a clothespin, literally a clothespin, and makes a, an enormous monument out of it. And again, what it's doing is it's taking this trivial, mundane, everyday thing and monumentalizing it, making it huge, making it the subject of high art. That's what all the pop artists are doing. They're taking these things that we consider to be boring and insignificant and magnifying them a hundred times over, either to show us that these insignificant things are actually really important, or, and maybe at the same time, to show us, look at how we have magnified these trivial matters uh, in this Western capitalist society. Um... Isn't it true that this, that this tendency of pop art extends to us today, in which I think uh, we could say our culture for, tends to focus a lot on the more trivial things and blowing smaller tidbits of information or ideas way out of proportion and forgetting the scale of what is really important or serious and what is uh, insignificant, and so we can be... In, be uh, entertained by the Kardashians, um, but something, some tweet that happens by a Kardashian or someone else becomes monumental, uh, and meanwhile, uh, some really important things don't get as much of our attention. Um, so pop art really is, I think, tapping into the very rhythms of late 20th century life that, that are not foreign to us today. They just lay, are laying the groundwork, showing what would, uh, what would come later. Um, we can end this conversation uh, on 20th century art, I think, by turning to the minimalists um, of the late 20th century. Um, and the minimalists do a lot of things that are really interesting. Um, you can look at Donald Judd's Untitled, where there are these kind of, you can, if you look in the book, there are the, uh, uh, green boxes covering the wall, um, where these small, trivial, uh, seemingly simplistic things, usually industrial materials, so again, taking mundane things that are usually invisible to us and putting them into the artwork, um, stresses this reproducibility uh, in its simplicity or minimalism it's trying to take the everyday and again make it uh, worthy of contemplation or force us to address the fact that that is the only thing that we really contemplate anymore uh, Agnes Martin untitled number nine um, minimalism is on a spectrum as all of these movements are uh, you you could ask the question, is there too much minimalism? Is there a point in which the artist um, isn't just loosely involved, like Warhol, who's simply mechanically reproducing things? Or it, at times, maybe even it seems as though someone like Agnes Martin in Untitled Number 9 is not involved really much at all. Um, the artist seems to be lost in this oversimplification and over-minimalization that's going on. The grandeur of human experience um, is being diminished as the trivial is being um, blown out of proportion. Critics of pop art would agree that there are... Um, what is there really to enjoy about this excessively simplistic uh, or minimalist approach. What is there to enjoy in seeing images of soup cans duplicated and recycled? 
but supporters of pop art would argue that that's not really the point. It's really about what isn't uh, being shown here. It's actually about the contrast with high art and the enslavement of the senses to seeing paintings in a certain way. We've been enslaved and enchained to older ways of looking at the world. By alienating the viewer in the way that it does, pop art actual, uh, actually um, shows us exactly how dehumanized the world is. It actually reveals to us um, that maybe if the artist isn't involved in this particular artwork, or it seems as though the artist has no place there anymore, that may be important in and of itself. The fact that the artist has disappeared uh, or that their task is no longer as important as it used to be, that is something worth contemplating, according to the pop artists. Moreover, I think if you wanted to take a more optimistic perspective when it comes to pop art, you could look at how uh, spectators of, the, of pop art are asked to fill in these gaps, where, where you have these kinds of minimalist, everyday objects, uh, and there's no more kind of heavy-handed, think about the big da 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 think about the existence of shapes and rhythms and da da there no more uh, big picture um, there's no more big picture work to be done here instead where the gaps are around these kinds of mundane products or artworks um, you have the freedom to think for yourself pop art is vacuous, it's empty, but there's something in the, that emptiness that allows us to think about who we are and think about the emptiness of where we are as, as a society, where we're headed. Um, there's something terribly liberating about it, and that's really true of modernist and postmodernist art across the board. It's the liberation of the way that we can contemplate things. We're no longer being going through the kind of rote act of looking the way people have always told us to look at the world. And instead, these artists invite people to dramatically depart from those older ways of seeing, um, to really open their eyes for the first time, um, and potentially change everything. So with that sentiment, the sentiment of changing everything, uh, we can close out our discussion of 20th century art. I think that sentiment pretty much encapsulates the entirety of um, the semester's artworks, that there is this need to radically revise and do something um, completely unexpected. And we can understand that now that we've looked at the history, looked at the theology, looked at the um, literature. We can understand this impulse to break down the older ways that don't work and try to really see things as they are for the first time. Um, and that doesn't end with the pop artists, uh, but it certainly is a move onto a different path, the path that we currently stand on today. So I hope you've enjoyed the art. Uh, I hope you can appreciate the pop artists. I, I know I certainly uh, really look forward to looking back over their artworks every year. Um, if you have any questions, send them my way, but if not, I will look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, in the days ahead. Thanks.